the Lord in prayer. And um, as uh, we continue our worship this evening. But let's just bow and thank the Lord. And, and, uh, and t- you know, there's, as a church, as you know, even from this morning, there's some in the time of great sorrow and there's some with some great and glorious news. And that's family life sometimes. And uh, we mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice and everywhere in between. And just thanks for being a faithful church family, reaching out. And, uh, you know, anybody that has a, a you know, ladies even specifically, uh, you know, want to drop a note to um, Nancy or to uh, the other wives, um, men reaching out to the, the men in the Bly family. It's been neat to see different ones do that, uh, even as they're mourning as a family, as uh, Dave shared this morning. But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and start our service off with, uh, before the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, as a church family, uh, it's been a neat weekend. We've had many opportunities just to uh, share the good news. We've had opportunity to um, just seek the minister to people. Even as we have some within our own congregation, really uh, in time of great uh, loss and sorrow, and to thank you that you ultimately are the God of all comfort who comforts us. Use the church family in that process as well. Continue to give us strength uh, even to reach out to those in need. But Lord, we're also very much uh, looking forward to uh, this new week. And uh, we're looking forward to tomorrow and Monday through Friday. And Lord, we know there's many, many people that have been diligently preparing, Pastor Thomas and leading this and uh, overseeing it, and uh, many teachers preparing, many helpers and workers and people providing resources, and we just look forward to your word going forth uh, tomorrow in the lives of the children in our community and in our own church family. Uh, We pray that there would be fruit that would come from this ministry, and uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, not only the children would be reached, but entire families would come to know you, even as we saw this morning the importance of fathers and, and mothers even, and just, uh, Lord, work in lives, we pray, and uh, strengthen uh, those that will be serving and involved in the ministry, and uh, just give them great strength physically, but also spiritually, strengthen them in the inner man, remove the discouragements, the distractions, and Just allow them to be able to uh, uh, share uh, the love of Christ with, uh, with, uh, in your word, with those that are going to be coming and in attendance. May your word run and be glorified, and and uh, we pray that um, um, the spiritual warfare would just uh, be one in the power of the Lord, and we yield ourselves and our church family to you in this upcoming ministry. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the uh, songs that goes right with the uh, theme of uh, even our perfect Heavenly Father is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And uh, Mike is going to lead us tonight on the piano. Thank you, Micah, for doing that.
singing tonight and uh, we come to our memory verse which uh, some have even said boy that's kind of a discouraging verse for the month and uh, you know it's just kind of this cycle of uh, going the wrong direction the nation of Israel at the time maybe next week or next month we'll just do rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice but uh, there's really some powerful lessons for us even in this verse isn't there And there's some warnings for us in this passage, and uh, obviously one of the reasons we picked it is because it's fitting with our theme for the LifeLink ministry on uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the summer, and uh, we're just seeing this cycle continue, continue in the uh, nation of Israel during the time of the Judges. So let's read it together tonight. Ready? Judges chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Judges 2, 11 and 12. All right. Anybody want to try it tonight? 
Any observations from that verse passage in this morning's message? What did they do? They provoked the Lord to anger, right? That's kind of interesting little thought. Well, any observations on this verse? We haven't, I don't know if we've done that this month yet. Things that stand out to you as you've just been thinking on it, meditating on it, Kathy? Um, of the people who were all around them, the, the gods that were all around the people, everything was around these people, and everything is around us yeah. today. We're surrounded at every, everywhere you look. In the world, right? We are, and we're in it. We're supposed to be in it, but not of it, right? And uh, yeah, great point, great point. My point is, they forgot all the blessings that God wanted them. They forgot how he parted the sea to get them through, how he delivered them. They forgot all that so easily and bowed down to other gods. Yeah. What terrible masters, what terrible gods they are, right? The ones around, all around us, right? But the true God, so good. Yeah, great, Vicky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Brett. Yeah, that, that, that is actually a great up um, because uh, there's a repetitive um, storyline, a repetitive theme in, in the context, and they constantly um, keep doing the same things over and over and over again. And it's like, man, if you just can't see the love and patience of God even in the Old Testament, then you're really not looking at the Bible. You know, because you, God is so amazingly patient with these people. Yeah. You know? If we uh, read a little further, we'd see when they cry out to him, what does he do, right? And uh, forgives and works, raises up a deliverer. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Anyone else? Well, be encouraged. And if you haven't yet joined in on the study of the lessons of the judges, there's a group that meets here every Wednesday night. There's a couple other groups. You can see them on the bulletin board in the foyer. One group meets Tuesday. Um, one's Wednesday afternoon. But uh, participate. It's a great one that, you you know, even if you miss the beginning, it's uh, the judges kind of are, you know, little individual judges after that. So it's a great one to just be able to join in that study at any time. So if you haven't yet come, we'd encourage you to participate. And those that are coming, may you be encouraged through the lessons from the judges. And let's keep meditating and thinking on Judges 2, 11 and 12. But at this time... It's a, a mighty fortress is our God. Amen.
and thinking as a body of believers um, in light of even this morning and the various trials we may be going through, seeing this as not only a comfort to yourself um, between you and the Lord, but also as an encouragement to one another. Micah for leading us um, and for ministering to us in that way. Well, we're back into 1 Peter. Um, we have been in 1 Peter back all throughout this whole past year. Then we took a little break because just busyness and things happening. But now we, we only had a few verses left and now we're back there. 1 Peter chapter 5 will be in verse eight, verses 8 through 14, finishing off the book. But before we do that, Let's just thank the Lord for the comfort we have in him. Thinking about everything that's going on with our brothers and sisters that are really mourning a loss. And you think about Peter and how he's writing to Christians who are also mourning loss. And he's trying to encourage them and comfort them in hope. And in, as Mr. Bly was sharing even this morning about we are hopeful and we look towards a hope. It just reminds me of 1 Peter in that, in 1 Peter 1, 3, where it says, Blessed be the God and Father 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is living and sure. And so even as we go into this time with 1 Peter 5, let's just even remember that context and even just remember our brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Father, we pray and we thank you that your faithfulness is sure, that we can stand fast in your promise and in your truth. And thank you, Lord, that you are our mighty fortress, that you are faithful. And Lord, as we even study your word this evening, May you be glorified. May we be edified to worship you, to be watchful and discerning in our lives, finding our hope fully in Christ and standing firm on the grace of Christ. Praise us all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have been, we're, we have taken a break in 1 Peter, but now we are back. And just a little overview of 1 Peter as we have studied this book. Um, it is Peter encouraging believers that are suffering through trials and challenges and tribulations, immense persecution happening in the area of Asia Minor. And as he's writing through this book, he reminds them of the living hope and then encourages them to conduct themselves in a way that is honoring to the Lord. And you see that in, um, in chapter 1 and verses 13 through 21. You don't have to look there, but it, that he talks about how because you are children of God, you've been begotten again to a hope, you are to live in a certain way. As children of God, you have a heavenly father and he wants you to live a certain way. You're to be imitators of God, just even how tying into Pastor Leary with, with Ephesians 5 and in that. And we are to be holy and set apart so that this world will know as we are a beacon to the world of the house of God. And so even with that, going from that, he's encouraging them and he's talking about various institutions, the institution of the family, the church, the government, and all those, and how to conduct themselves in that. We come to the very tail end of the book is where we are now, where he starts to, he's in the section of addressing the church, and he's talking about all of you, but he's talking about addressing them and how their conduct is to be in relation to their enemy. And that's where we are, talking about the flock of God. He gives the idea of the flock of God. God Christ is the shepherd. And the one who cares for your souls, which is a great comfort, especially for those who are suffering, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And it's just a great encouragement. He is our shepherd of the flock. And so being part of the flock of, a, a flock of God in this very dark world, in the presence of a very dark enemy, Peter has these three encouragements or three meanings of how, what it looks like to be the flock of God in the face of our enemy, in the face of discouragement and the lies of the evil one. And that's where we find it in 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 8. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And in this last little part, he's encouraging being part of the flock of God in this dark world means, first of all, being sober. And he says it right here. It says in verse um, in verse 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant. And if you do a study of these two words, he, um, the usage of these words throughout the New Testament, you're actually going to learn um, in the context of the book, and also in the New Testament, you'll learn that there's two things that you can, you can learn about being sober. But first of all, this first word, sober, it's a nepsate is the word. It means to be as sober or to abstain from wine. It's this idea of having control of your emotions and your desires being controlled and self-controlled. 
used in scripture is often referred to when, when, uh, when a writer in scripture and he writes and he says, encourage them to be sober. It's used oftentimes connection with the end being near, with the imminence of Christ, looking towards the judgment of God and being alert that his coming is coming soon. We don't know when. We've been in that state for 2,000 years. But that has been the encouragement. And then the second word, um, also actually for this first word, be sober. You see it in 1 Peter 1.13. It says this, therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. That's the word. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There you see, that's an example. Also in 1 Peter 4.7, just a few verses back. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious, the same word, be sober, and watchful in your prayers. So his encouragement here is to be alert, be awake. The second word he has here, be sober, be vigilant. The word vigilant, it means to, it's, it's the word gregoreo. Um, it's kind of where the, the, the kind of the name Gregory comes from. It means to stay awake, to be aware, you know, to, to arise, to be awake, and not to fall asleep. Jesus used this often, and it was used, written often in Matthew, chapter, Matthew chapter 24 through 26, to be alert, be sober, talking about the end times. It, it means to be aware or conceived as being awake. So why is soberness talked about here in the very end part of 1 Peter? Why is that talked about? In light of the imminence of Christ and God judging the world, and in light of the Christians, those who are the elect of God. What does the usage of these words in the context of the book teach us to be sober about? Two things. One, the end is near. You just saw it in 1 Peter 4, 7, where it says the end is near. Be serious, watchful in your prayers. We have been called to an eternal glory in Christ. Something, an amazing hope that we've been talking about. 1 Peter 1, 3, we just read it earlier. This amazing living hope we need to be alert that we are alive. And if you look down at verse 10, it says this, may, may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while. After what? You have suffered a short time. In light of eternity and all the time here on earth, our time in suffering is extremely small. The trials that we face, they are painful, extremely painful. And actually, they're the most pain we're going to experience in the light of eternity. But it is extremely short. It's a little while. It's short in comparison to the great hope that we have in Christ. The end is near. It's like even what 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. We've read this earlier as we were going through 1 Peter. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For though our light of affliction... Which is, just, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The definition of faith there. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. The end is near. What do we look to? Do we sometimes just get so wrapped up in our everyday that we, we forget about this amazing hope that we have in Christ. Usually in trials, we're reminded of it. And even when our brothers and sisters are going through trials, they remind us of it. It's like even in Ecclesiastes 7.2, right? It's great to be in the house of mourning because it reminds us of the end of man. That reminder there. Trials refine us in that. Sometimes we can lose sight of what is most important, our living hope. Sometimes we lose sight of the eternal and the spiritual, and we can focus on just the physical and temporal. Another reason, the first one is the end is near. That's why we need to watch. But the other one is found right in our passage in verse 8. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He uses the word adversary, which is um, the word antidikos, which it means accuser, opponent, or a plaintiff, somebody who has a case against you, somebody who's seeking to fight against you, somebody who, who wants to bring you down. 
That is our enemy. We were just learning about the mighty fortress is our God, right? We, we, were singing, we were singing that, and we were also singing about how we have this enemy. And though the trials are dark and gleam, we still have a truth that, that Christ is holding us fast. And we also have the truth that Christ is using us in this dark time to be the bearers of truth, be the ones speaking truth. We cannot forget about this enemy. He is the one who has a case against us. And the new time, in the New Testament, all the, a lot of the other times that this word is used, adversary, um, it's used in the, in the Gospels a couple. It's oftentimes uh, the, the writer of, uh, it, that's using that word is using it and saying, hey, those who have a case against you, you need to go and reconcile to them. This is the only time or one of the fewest times that he's using, okay, no, that is your adversary. You need to be watch out for that adversary. You need to, st- you know, you need to be alert. And, and we'll see later that it's also being resistant of that adversary. We have a very real enemy, but sometimes we forget our enemy because we do not see our enemy. We are in a spiritual war, not a physical one. Sometimes it's fleshed out physically, though. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12 reminds us of this. Put on the full armor, whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, our adversary right there. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Even when we were out there in Burger Fest, you could even tell that there was a spiritual war going on. Some of the people that you would interact with This enemy is very dangerous. What's so dangerous about this enemy? Well, it says that he's walking around like a roaring lion. And I was was kind of doing a little bit of research on this, and he's seeking whom he may devour. The word devour means to swallow whole, just to consume. And I was doing a little research on this, and I was like, you know what, let me Google this. I'm going to Google significance of a lion's roar. And so this website came up on this, like, foundation of uh, lions that roar, and it was very interesting just to read... um, the Latin, and, and just learn some lessons from a lion's roar. Um, and so they roar, this is very interesting, they roar mostly at night in the dark. That's when they roar the most. It's very interesting that they are most aggressive at night and they roar at night. During the daytime, they actually seem most docile. Sometimes people are like, oh, wow, a cute cat over there out in the, the field. Like, oh, they don't seem that scary. But at nighttime, they're very aggressive and that's when they hunt. In the darkest trials, our enemy will hunt us down. And you will see the more aggressive. But sometimes we forget about our enemy and we think of him as very docile and one who does not have much danger. Sometimes we even get a little comfortable with his lies, comfortable with the sins that he says are not so bad. That's why he's called the father of lies. But he is an adversary. Are we seeing our enemy as one who is docile or one who is dangerous. Not only that, um, their roar is very territorial, which is a very interesting thing also. Um, They roar when you are in their territory. When an intruder, somebody who's wanting to uh, uh, inhibit or attack or, or get a hold of their children or anything, any kind of foreigner, they will roar and attack that enemy. They will warn them and say, hey, I'm coming for you. It's very, very interesting because you think about it, we have been transferred from the domain of darkness and now we are children of the, of the son of his love and the kingdom of the son of his love, right? We've, we hear that in Colossians. We are no longer of his domain, of his territory. We are now the enemy of him. And when we both The thing is, is he is also very present on this earth. He is active and doing things, and this is his domain, right? And so we're going to see that he is going to be roaring and prowling after us. It's interesting also that his territory is called a pride. I thought that was interesting because if you remember, Satan's fall. And Isaiah 14 kind of mentions that, 14, 12 through 21, talks about how he is the one who's prideful and he falls because of that. Satan's domain is a domain of pride. And when you seek to hurt his pride, he will seek to attack you. Even if he is outnumbered, he will seek to attack you. 
as lions normally do. Those are just a few lessons from lions. But in all of that, do we see our enemy as docile or as dangerous? And are we viewing this world as a world of, that we are at war with the enemy? Or are we getting comfortable here? And that's what Peter's all about here, is he's reminding them, your home is not here. You are foreigners, pilgrims, and strangers in this world. And we are in a very real warfare. So Lessons of Lions kind of even reminds us, like, okay, we need to avoid this lion. Like, oh boy, okay, wow, we need to watch out for them. But if we see one, we might need to run. But that's not what Peter says. Look what he says next. He says, resist him. Steadfast in the faith. It's like, wait, what? Peter, you want me to resist the lion that's prowling around trying to devour me? So face a lion who's aggressively attacking me. Is that what you're saying? That's insane. Do you know that lions will attack to defend their pride even if they're outnumbered? And Satan is greatly outnumbered compared to the, all the heavenly hosts and the authority and the power of Christ. Christ is more powerful than our enemy, but that doesn't mean he won't fight. It doesn't mean he won't attack. The word resist here, it's actually, it means, uh, it means to oppose, resist, to be hostile toward, and it actually brings us to the second point, which is being, um, being part of the flock of God in this dark world also means standing in op- opposition to the enemy. Resist him. And how How are we, well, if you think about it, actually, pause in a second. So he's not saying to avoid, and he actually doesn't even say that you're going to not get hurt when you're resisting your enemy. When you resist a lion, you're going to get scratched up. And that's what these believers are going through right now. They are being scratched up. They are going through persecution. Some of them are being mauled and killed for the name of Christ because they are in the enemy's territory proclaiming the gospel of truth. Standing in opposition to the enemy. How are we to do that? There's two things. You see it here. Because um, it's down in verse 9. Resist him, steadfast in the faith. You're to be characterized in standing firm. The word means to be firm in the faith. It kind of reminds us, if you go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, um, verses 4, it says this. Um, and you think about this. is that we're, How do we stand firm in the faith? We stand firm on Christ. Christ is our solid rock. Here it says this. Coming to him... As to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, a land Zion, a chief's cornerstone, elect precious. He who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Doesn't mean we won't get scars but it means that we won't be put to shame when Christ returns at the day of Jesus Christ and the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are to stand firm in all boldness. Are we doing that so others will have to stumble over us on their way to eternal torment? That's what he even says. He continues on down here. He says, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Are, they, are we being bold enough standing firm against our enemy and others having to trip over us, even kick us sometimes, on their way to eternal torment? the wrath of God that is coming. It was, just an, it was a challenge even for me just to think about that. Am I standing firm? Am I being bold for the grace of God, the grace of God that I have received, not by my own merits, that I cannot achieve or attain? With firmness of faith. The second way, it's, are we standing firm? The second way, it says here to, to resist him, it's to resist him and just, it's just to resist him with knowledge. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. It is not foreign to you to experience it. Not foreign to you to experience it. It's interesting here, if you see the word experienced, it actually means, it's a passive, so it means it's happening to them. 
but it's actually accomplished is the word. It means to be, it's, it's accomplishing something. Um, and it's, it's, so it's like this, he's viewing this suffering, these trials as an accomplishment. It's, and it kind of reminds us of even, if you look back at chapter four, verses 12 through 13, beloved, do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing were happening to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Don't count it strange, but rejoice. It's an accomplishment to take part in the sufferings of our dear Savior. Suffering is not an isolated thing. There are brothers and sisters in other, other countries around the world that experience and bear the scars of persecution. And just the small persecution that we experience here is nothing in comparison to what they experience. But we are sometimes, we don't stand firm. Sometimes we are not bold. So this knowledge of knowing our brothers are suffering should be an encouragement, but it should also be an exhortation to go and be bold and stand firm. To be bold for Christ. And then the third thing, so we learn that it means being sober. It means, stand, it means standing and opposing our enemy. And the third thing is it means being sanctified. Look down here at verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory forever. Uh, to glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. But if you see here, being sanctified first, you can't be sanctified unless you are saved, right? Look what it says. The God of all grace. By grace, we have been saved through faith. It's not of our own doing. Yeah, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been saved in, in chapter one, verse three. He is the God of grace. His wrath is a very real thing. And we've been dead in our trespasses, but Christ, we've been made alive in Christ for those who have believed on him. By faith, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved through faith. Oops. Um, those who trust in Christ and believe on Jesus to be saved are saved by the grace of God. And we have a grace of God that we can rejoice in. So this, this grace of God, if you have not trusted in the grace of God, you are not called to his eternal glory. Instead, you're called to eternal torment. And the only way to be saved is by Christ Jesus, as you can see here. May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus. And then he continues on. So first, be saved. The second thing is be sanctified means being purified. Look what it says. After you have suffered a while, may he perfect establish and strengthen strengthen and settle you. Notice he says, after you have suffered a while. If you look back at 1 Peter 1, chapter 1, verse 6, it says this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, that little while that we just talked about, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to, the, to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord is refining us through these trials to sanctify us, to purify us, to give Christ all the more glory. Brothers and sisters that are in, that are in trials right now, we can encourage them with that truth, and we can mourn with them through their trials and walk alongside them. If you're going through a trial, remember that this is the Lord's refining time. And that you're not alone in that. It means being sanctified. Suffering produces character. And all that is worthless is put to the wayside when that happens. You start to focus on what is most important. So are you a part of his flock? Have you believed on Jesus to save you? If you have, amazing. If you haven't, that is where you are to be tonight. Is that you, you, you need to make that decision Am I trusting in Christ as my Savior? And if you are part of that flock, may we join together in being sober because all of these commands are plural. They're not just an individual, but they're all plural. It is the church we are to do this. We are to encourage one another and, and admonish one another to continue to live in being sober. 
Are we standing in opposition to an enemy? If you see a brother that's struggling in that, are you encouraging them and walking with them, helping them, strengthening them? Strengthen, admonish the unruly, strengthen the weak, and be patient with them all. And are we being sanctified in Christ, remembering that we are of the sanctification? Now, Peter, he, continue, he ends the book um, with that, and, and he, he ends the book with this final greeting, and he gives the summary of this whole book and the purpose of it. Look what it says. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Notice what his purpose here. It is, he, he, he's, he, what are we to stand firm in? We are to stand firm in the grace of God when it comes to even resisting our enemy, when it comes to interacting with those who are not part of the kingdom of his son. Are we standing firm in the grace by being a bold witness? And then are we rejoicing in the amazing grace that we have received by the gift of God, and sharing that with those who are on their way to eternal torment, who are, are held captive by this roaring lion, the domain of darkness. Maybe some of you have, or some of us have strayed from standing firm in this grace out of fear of what people might think, or fear of persecution, or fear of being judged, or coming across as insensitive in the world's eyes. Knowing that, God has given you the gra- knowing that God has given you the grace to turn from fearing man and to turn from fearing, and turn to fearing the Lord and obeying his word, standing firm in his grace and salvation only through Jesus Christ. When we rest fully in the hope that we have and in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, no matter what trials come, we have a sure hope and peace that, we can ne- that can never be taken away. Hence, when Peter ends this book, you look down, and it says, Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us rejoice in the amazing grace that we have received, and may we stand firm on that grace, being bold to proclaim his truth. Would you join with me in singing Amazing Grace in hymn number, I think, 202. And Mike is going to come on up.
you pray with me? And Father, we are so thankful for the amazing grace found in Christ. Help us and forgive us for the times where we have not stood firm. We're thankful that your grace is abundant. And Lord, we ask for your strength to stand upon this grace, to stand firm in this dark world, in this dark domain that we are surrounded by. Help us to not forget that we are just pilgrims passing through. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here and even for myself that we would continue to rejoice in this grace and we continue to stand firm and to encourage one another to be sober, to stand and resist the enemy and to remember that we are being sanctified. And we look forward to your return. We ask, come Lord Jesus, come soon. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.